remember the story of Adam and Eve? God promising that they would live forever with him if they would only walk with him in obedience? Do you remember the promise God made to Noah that he would never destroy the earth again? Do you remember the covenant God made with Abraham that he would be the father of many nations? Do you remember the covenant God made with the people of Israel and Moses after leading them out of slavery in Egypt? The promises of God have always been a source of hope for the people of God. In these 40 days leading up to Easter, this season of Lent and waiting, we remember the promises of God. God was faithful to keep his promises then, and he remains faithful today. As disciples running to the empty tomb following the crucifixion, we remember and we have hope. Well, it was a church conflict. Young pastor and his wife, in fact, they were co-pastors. And uh, they had pastored in, in a rural church for about four years. And uh, they were young and they made some mistakes and they admitted that. But there was a group of people that just became very agitated with them and, and did everything they could do to get them to leave. And so finally, a denominational official came to the church and uh, heard from the pastor and the co-pastor, and they shared, you know, we're young, we've made mistakes, but we love the church and we love these people. He then asked this group of people that were angry and frustrated, and, and they tried to be polite, but you could see the venom coming out. Finally, they were all done talking. And it was the, the uh, denominational official's turn. He took his time. Finally, he said, well, he said, I suppose the question is this. Is, is the resurrection enough? Is the resurrection enough? Is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead enough to get us beyond this little squabble time? Let's look at the scripture that, uh, that talks about the resurrection from Mark's gospel, chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, uh, bought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in, white, in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Now, what do we do with this news? What do we do with the, the report that Jesus rose from the dead? Some have said that Jesus was either a liar, or he was a lunatic, or perhaps he was just a legend, or he was Lord. And each of us have to answer that question for ourselves. I suppose one of the best ways to answer that question is to ask this question. 
our lives still being changed today because Jesus rose from the tomb. Let me tell you two stories. Bruce Rose uh, is the first story. His wife, Sue, was a dental hygienist for, for my, my dentist, Gordon Roush. And for seven years, Bruce would come in and would flirt with Sue, but Sue didn't pick up on it. It took seven years for her to understand that he was flirting, but in time she did. And in time they fell in love and they got married. Bruce retired from General Dynamics early, and he bought a smoking heart hot car, a cherry red Chevrolet Camaro. And he settled into retirement life and driving a hot car. Years before, way back in the 70s, Bruce had lost a younger brother named Jonathan. And when Jonathan died, Bruce said to himself, I want nothing to do with the Lord. Occasionally, he would go to church with Sue because he loved her. She was the center of his life, but he, he didn't want anything to do with the Lord. Bruce has had a battle for years and years, and now it was beginning to get the best of him. His struggle was with alcohol. He knew he had to get it under control, but he couldn't conceive of stopping drinking. It would be like losing one of his best friends. And at the time when the drinking problem was harder and harder to deny, a program started here at our church called Alpha. Alpha is an 11-week program that begins with a meal. Then it has a lesson. Then it is followed by table talk with the same people at the same table every week. Each week, they would talk about a different facet of the Christian faith. And in the question and answer period, they, they said that every question was valid. Alpha, A-L-P-H-A, every one of those letters stands for something. I can't tell you what they all stand for, but one of the A's stands for all questions allowed. Now, Sue started to talk to Bruce about going to Alpha, but he really wasn't interested until he learned that Tracy Cox was going to do the cooking. He decided to go, if for no other reason, than he'd have a great meal every Wednesday night. Bruce loved Tracy's cooking. And from the first session, Bruce found himself entranced at what he was hearing at Alpha. They encouraged questions, and, and Bruce had a ton of them, but they all were sincere And he didn't know what was happening. But he realized that he was yearning for something. That something was missing from his life. The enemy began to mess with Bruce. Gave him thoughts like, you know, you've gone too far. You've said too many things against the Lord. He was told over and over again in his imagination that he was not worthy of God's love. The spiritual battle in Bruce was intense. During the time they were attending Alpha, they began to attend church here. And to Bruce's amazement, he liked you. <laughs> and he said he got a lot out of the messages like they were pointed directly at him. So he was going to Alpha on Wednesdays and coming here on the weekends, and he was learning a lot, but he still was very hesitant. On the last night of Alpha, week 11, they have what's called testimony night in which people stand and they just talk about what the Lord has done in their lives. Sometimes big things, most times small things. In, in fact, last Wednesday, just, what, four or five days ago, was testimony night. Debbie and I went, and it, it just is outstanding. It's such an encouragement. The week leading up to testimony night was a difficult week for Bruce. Just a few days before Alpha, uh, he was brought home by a, def a deputy sheriff who found him passed out drunk. He had no idea how much he had been drinking. 
the sheriff released him into Sue's care and said, now if I have to come back here again, he's going to go to jail. I'm giving you a break this time. So they went to testimony night. Bruce now, a, a humble man. And they listened to the testimonies and Sue said, they both cried. It, it, it was so moving. And when it was over, and they got in their car to leave, he, he couldn't leave. He just began to weep. And, and he said, you know, either God's going to have to take me or release me. I can't live this way any longer. And that night, Bruce gave his life to the Lord there in that car with his wife. Sue said a change came over him. And the power was present. And his face shone like it had never before. Sue watched over the next several months. She said, I didn't see big changes, but I saw lots of little ones. She saw his heart change. He, he began to talk with his mom and his sister so much more. He told people that he had given his life to the Lord. And most importantly, he was at peace. When COVID-19 hit, they weren't able to attend church because um, Bruce had a number of underlying medical conditions that would prevent him from coming. But they watched every week and felt like the messages were just geared directly towards them. Towards the fall, Bruce was struggling with headaches. And he fell unexpectedly a couple times and banged his head hard. Sue had him take a CAT scan, but they found nothing there. On Tuesday, September 23rd, in the middle of the night, Bruce passed away. He had had some physical difficulties. But no one expected him to die anytime soon. As you can imagine, the next while was so hard on Sue and the, the kids. They had good days and they had bad days and they had days they just clung to the Lord. But one joyous thing remained. Sue knew that because Bruce gave his life to the Lord, he was now in the presence of the Lord. And that she would see him again. Sue and I have visited two or three times as I've gotten this testimony. And she's convinced she will see him again. Let me tell you another story. Morley Galbraith was a young father in his 20s. When World War II broke out and he went he did his best to try to stay safe and out of the skirmishes. He became a welder and worked on equipment. But as they pushed into Germany, he was part of the force that liberated a, a Jewish concent, concentration camp. All of the guards at the concentration camp and all of the officials had fled, leaving just the sick and emaciated prisoners. Morley said they were like stick figures walking. All bones but big, pleading eyes. That was the close of the war. The war ended just days after that and Morley was shipped back home. But he had seen things that no one ought to have seen. He saw things that he never talked about. You know, in the 1940s, no one understood PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. It, 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 it wasn't something that was even known. So a lot of GIs suffered through the terrors of war for years. Some men were able to put the war behind them and live lives of peace, but some men never did. And some took to a bottle and drowned the terrors and drowned the nightmares so they wouldn't have to think about what they saw. And this was the story of Morley Galebreath. He began to drink 
so heavily. Morley had a son named Bob. And Bob, who was just a little boy when his dad went off to war, and just a couple years older when he came back, learned to live under the erratic behavior of a man who was one way when he was sober, and quite a different way when he was drunk. Morley drank heavily. And one of the times, uh, he just went on a binge. And it was severe. And they came, the, the, the county officials came, and they took the children away from Morley and his wife. Most of the children went to live at the VFW home in Eaton Rapids, Michigan. The eldest sister named Judy was uh, put in a foster home. Bob said that that was the toughest separation of his life. They just wept and wept that his sister uh, was not going to be with him. In fact, he didn't see her for 11 years. Judy went to live with a Christian couple who took her to church at a local Nazarene church, as a matter of fact, where she came to know the Lord. And she wrote Bob all the time. She wrote him of her love for him and the Lord's love for him. Bob, there in the VFW home with his two younger brothers in the same cottage, his brother Richard, who was four, his brother Chucky, who was just three. It was there that Bob had his first taste of religion. Every Sunday, they would take the kids from the VFW home, put them in a bus, and they would drive to a big United Methodist church. They would march them up the steps through the lobby and up into the balcony. They never met any of the church people. They never interacted with them. The church people really didn't want anything to do with them. And it was such a bad taste in Bob's mouth. He said, I will never go to church again. After two years of living in the VFW home, his mom and dad got back together. And they moved to Battle Creek, Michigan, close to Kellogg's, where his dad was working His career was advancing, but so was his alcoholism. One December, his dad went on a drinking binge and took off for four weeks. On Christmas Eve, Bob's mother told Bob and and his brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, we have absolutely no money for presents. There, There will be no Christmas this year. But Bob's father returned home that day. He gave his mom a a few dollars, and and although the snow was up to her waist, she marched into town without boots to cover her shoes, and she found a little drugstore where she bought everything she could buy with that little bit to give to her children. They moved again to Augusta, Michigan. They rented half of a farmhouse. Bob remembers getting off the bus at at his house and seeing his mother in the front yard, sitting on their couch, surrounded by all of their furniture and belongings, and she was weeping uncontrollably. They had been evicted. All of their stuff removed because of non-payment. Bob's dad had fled, and mom had no way of caring for Bob, brothers and sisters, so they put the boys in JDC, juvenile defense, detention center, along with the other juveniles that were guilty of of crimes. Bob said the, the experience was horrendous. He managed to escape, but they caught him. They brought him back, and the guards beat him severely. Bob said this was the toughest situation of his life. Eventually, they were reunited with their parents, and they lived together for a time. And the, age, the ages between Bob being 12 and being 18 are years that Bob would just as soon forget. He, he lived in outright rebellion, and by the age of 15, he had a considerable drinking problem himself. Finally, when he turned 18, he enlisted in the Air Force and shipped out. His sister Judy, remember her? Went to live with a Christian family and became a Christian. She wrote him all the time. She told him of her love for him and Jesus' love for him. He read the letters but was not moved. When he was discharged from the service and came home, he found that 
his parents were breaking up for the last time. Mom was soon to move to California where she would live for decades. Dad was left raising uh, the rest of the family and Bob decided to stay with dad to help with his younger brothers and sisters. One afternoon he was in the front yard playing baseball with his brothers. A big car drove up. A couple elderly people got out, really dressed up nicely. The man came over and talked to Bob, and finally he said, you know, he said, you know I, I, I go to this church downtown, and I wanted to come and invite you. Would you and your brothers and sisters like to come? And, and to his amazement, he said, well, okay. <laughs> so on Sunday, he got dressed up. He helped his brothers and sisters dress up, and they walked to the little church in town. And to his amazement, he really enjoyed it. And he enjoyed the pastor, Pastor Dale. And, uh, and when it was over, they were walking home and he said, you know, I think I'm going to go back. And all of his brothers and sisters said, yeah, we want to go back too. Sunday came and to his amazement, they all got up and got themselves dressed. He didn't even have to help them. And they walked to the little church. That day, Pastor Dale was preaching about the one lost sheep. It's a parable Jesus told in Luke 15. And as it got close to the end, Bob said he felt like a, a huge weight had settled in on him. He said, I couldn't breathe. And I began to cry. And then all of a sudden, it seemed like Pastor Dale was speaking specifically to me. He thought, am I dying? Pastor Dale, preaching to everybody, but it seemed like he was talking to him, said, would you like to come forward and lose the guilt and the weight of sin? And Bob did. He ran to an altar, ran down front and knelt, where he wept and wept. Pastor Dale came and prayed with him. He was crying too. And Bob said, at a point in time in the prayer, something broke, and it felt like all the weight of the world lifted off of him. He was light as he could imagine, like he could almost fly. He stood up and he looked around, and all of his brothers and sisters were there also. They also had prayed. Here's a, a picture of Bob. Oh, that's a picture of Bruce Rose. I forgot to show you. <laughs> Here's a picture of Bob, taken just last week at Hosanna. Bob and his wife Dixie are out of town this week, visiting a son who's also a pastor. It's, it's interesting how God moves, even in tragic situations. Bob's mom lived in California for 35 years, but she eventually came home. One day, Bob took her to church where she heard a message and she came forward and gave her life to the Lord at 86 years of age, which does not happen very often. Bob's dad, at the last two years of his life, apologized to each of his children for the way he had lived his life. And he, too, became a Christian at the end. In fact, all but one of Bob's brothers and sisters are following Jesus, and there's still time left for that one. Because of what Jesus did on a cross, and because of what Jesus did when he strode triumphantly from the grave, Bob is a different man than he would have been. Bob says, my life verse is this, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Bruce Rose, Bob Galbraith, those names could be multiplied by millions of the people whose lives have been changed and people whose lives continue to be changed. Let's go back to the scripture. I want you to see something. The angel said to the ladies, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Imagine when Peter heard those words. The ladies came back and they said, the angel said, go tell Peter and this. He said, wait a minute. 
The angel said my name, yes. He didn't say John, no. Didn't say Andrew, no. He said your name, Peter. At this point, Peter felt like such an incredible failure. Jesus told him, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. He said, not going to (laughs) happen. It happened. And he felt such a weight of failure. It was the lowest point in his life. But the angel said, go tell Peter. And Peter's life was changed. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see that Peter went on and did incredible things in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're like one of these characters. Maybe like Bruce Rose, you lost somebody that you love. And you can't understand why God didn't do something about it. And a a real wall between you and the Lord has gone up. Ted Turner, the guy who owns the Braves and CNN, that was his experience. He was a young Christian until his brother died. He walked away. Maybe you grew up in an addictive household or have struggled addictively yourself. And the residue of that has been so hard on you. Maybe, like Peter, you have failed. I certainly have. Believe me, I have. And the guilt of that and the weight of that is so oppressive on you. But I want to tell you, our Savior lives. Our Savior has risen from the dead. And he continues to change lives. Maybe you are beginning to come out of this year, this terrible year of COVID. And the relationship you once had with the Lord isn't nearly as close as it was in the past. And maybe today, now, is the time to see that change. I want to ask you to stand. We're going to sing a little song. I don't do this often, but I'm doing it now. And I want to say to people who've lost someone, And it's put a a wall between you and the Lord. You can get beyond that. Jesus rose from the dead. Maybe you grew up in an addictive environment or maybe you have suffered with addiction. And I want to tell you, you can get beyond that because Jesus rose from the dead. Maybe you have failed and failed dramatically, but I want to tell you, you can go beyond that because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Maybe you have, uh, over this year of COVID, your spiritual life has, has ebbed down. And I want to tell you, you can get beyond that because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I'm going to ask you, if, if the Lord is speaking to you now, as we sing this song, I, I'd like you to come and just kneel whether you're giving your life to the Lord for the first time or whether you've been a believer for a long time and it's just time to recommit yourself to the Lord. I want to ask you that if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you know if he is because if he is, your heart's beating fast. Your palms are getting sweaty. You're nervous. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, I want to ask you to obey him come forward. Would you? Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. 
Lord, I'm amazed by you and how you love me. You paint the morning sky. You paint the morning sky with miracles in mind. My hope will always stand for you hold me in your hand. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you and how you love me. If the Lord is speaking to you, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. I want you to respond. Some have begun to. We're not going to drag this out. But I want you to respond. There are some people in this room today that need to respond. Would you? So we sing one more time. Would you obey the Lord as he speaks to you? How deep. How wide, how great is your love for me? Oh, how deep, how wide. How great is your love for me, Lord, I'm amazed by you, Lord, I'm amazed by you, Lord, I'm amazed by you. How you love me. He is risen. Yeah, you say he is risen indeed. He has. We're going to give our friends kneeling here the quiet they need to pray. It's so good to see you. I'm seeing some of you I haven't seen in so long. It's so good to see you. Go in the power of a risen Savior. Father, I pray your blessing on these I love and you love so much more. Would they know the strength and power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to them? And would they live accordingly? Bless them now in the name of Jesus.